All right. So once more, welcome to this APH Access Academy webinar on lap time and lullabies, sharing the joy of literacy with young children and toddlers who are very, who are visually impaired or blind. I'm sorry. <laughs> I said that backwards. Lap time and lullabies, sharing the joys of literacy for infants, toddlers, and very young children who are blind or have low vision. We are uh, joined today with our presenters, Jessica Chandler, Kay Clark, and Jimmy, J Ginny uh, Remus. And so we will get started. There we go. There we go. Uh, so first of all, welcome to Jessica Chandler. She is the Associate Director of the Washington State School for the Blind's uh, Birth to Five Outreach. Kay Clark, the author of Lap Time and Lullabies, and Ginny Remus, the Assistant Director of Statewide Services for Birth to, Birth to Five at the Ohio State School for the Blind. And with that, I am going to turn it over to Kay Clark. Okay. Well, first of all, we would like to thank you, Leslie, and also Aaron, Jeff, and Amy for the invitation to come. Can everyone hear me now? Okay, I'm sorry. Shall I start over? <laughs> okay. Yeah. I'm sorry. <laughs> Technical glitch here. Um, thank you, Leslie and Aaron, and also Jeff and Amy for the invitation to do this presentation today. And good afternoon to everyone out there. I am Kate Clark, and Jenny and Jessica and I would like to extend a warm welcome to the APH, today's APH Lap Time and Lullabies webinar. Over the next hour, we will explore a sampling of the Lap Time Lullabies kit that was developed for children birth to three years of age. With your input, we also hope to jumpstart some creative thinking about the very earliest stage of literacy. You may find the Lap Time and Lullabies kit is also a good fit for some children who are slightly older and have a combination of special needs and are be just beginning their journey uh, into literacy. There is a question mark on this slide, a bright red one, and that indicates that we have a couple of questions to follow. Next slide, please. The first one is a poll question. And if you would please indicate, what is your level of experience in parenting or serving infants and toddlers who are blind or have low vision? That would help us to understand our group a little better if you would respond. And the categories are none, one to five years, six to 10 years, and 10 plus years. And we currently have about 70% have participated. So I'll go ahead and end the poll and share the results. And we have a tie, one to five years is 39%, as well as 10 plus years. We have a, the six to 10 years of experience at 13% and 9% have no experience. Okay, we have a nice diverse group here. Okay, let's move on to the second question so we can pick your brain a little bit. This one, if you record in the chat, please, and this is wide open. 
When you think of literacy, what words first pop into your head? Anything goes. Communication, reading, language, reading and writing, comprehension, lots of reading, reading, rhyming. Braille. Abilities. Braille, yep. Dr. Seuss. These are all great. Um, Concepts. Starts at birth. I love that one. I love them all. The love of reading books. Not an eight. Mm -hmm. Life and life experiences. Okay, great. You had a lot of really good suggestions and that kind of gets us started in really thinking about how diverse literacy is. Could we move to the next slide, please? Okay. Actually, um, based on your responses, it's obvious that there are a host of skills and competencies that actually comprise literacy. There is a picture here on this slide of a smiling mom with her little boy, and I'm judging that by his blue jacket. And she is supporting his arm with her hand underneath his arm so he can reach out to explore this beautiful flowering bush. And I think we can kind of see an analogy here a little bit with um, actual literacy. If we look at planting that beautiful flowering bush, we take a seed, and we dig a little hole in the ground, we plant it in the ground and cover it up. And then we hope we remember to water. And we also hope that the sun will come down and shine and warm the earth. Then we sit and we wait. We wait for some time. And then all of a sudden, up pops a little sprout out of the ground. And that might even signify traditional literacy. But what we're really talking about today is all of that stuff that goes on underneath that ground that we don't see or not even aware of, but that is absolutely critical for that little sprout of literacy to come out of the ground. And that is actually the earliest stage of literacy. Next slide, please. So today, what we hope to accomplish, and we actually have two parts to this. Our today's part is part one, and we hope to lay the groundwork, look at components and the parts of the lap time and lullabies kit. So we have all of the logistical things understood. And then Jenny and Jessica are going to continue on with part two and look at applications for many parts of the lap time and lullabies with your help. There's a picture here of a dad and he has this little toddler girl in a pretty blue dress and they are sitting out in the woods on a blanket reading a book. And this is certainly what we hope to have make available to all of our children at some level. So today, um, these are our objectives and we're kind of not using traditional objective language, but kind of looking at really what we are hoping to accomplish with you today. We're gonna to take a look first at the traditional definition of literacy and compare it with a newly expanded definition. Then we're going to explore the 12 major components of the earliest stage of literacy as outlined in the lap time and lullabies kit. Next, we hope we send you away and with everybody kind of contributing with some newly, new early literacy ideas that you can apply with your team and your children through your families. And then we're going to kind of look carefully at the parts of the lap time and lullabies kit and then how you can access that kit for your use. But first, it's critical to know what is literacy. We kind of all know that kind of a traditional definition would indicate that that is the ability of an individual to read and to write. In more recent years, folks, particularly those working with young children, like the little toddler, toddler, actually a crawler, who is pictured here in her little sweater, and she is crawled up to a book, and she is looking at a simple picture of a gray elephant in the book. People who are working with real young children, and also children with kind of complex combinations of special needs, have looked at this definition and have decided to expand it, not only to include reading and writing, 
but to include speaking and listening. And this new definition also highlights some mini skills, such as turning the pages of a book and learning new words, and also learning what anticipation cues are. For example, if you pull keys out of your pocket or out of your purse and they make a jingle sound, your young child will learn that every time they hear that, that jingle sound, that it is time to go bye-bye. This new concept of literacy really opens up the possibilities for all children at some level. So if we're going to look at this earliest stage, what are some important things that we might wanna know about? And there are at least two areas. One is what are the competencies or skill areas that we really wanna be sure we introduce to young children? And the second thing might be, how do we reach and teach our youngest literacy learners? The Laptime and Lullabies Kit was de developed as a framework to help us with those two areas. Noted on this slide are two websites. One is for the handbook or the booklets, and the other is for the little storybooks that we will talk about later. And these will be in the chat box for your information. The Laptime and Lullabies Parent Handbook is actually broken into a number of booklets. And within that booklet, booklets, there are 12 major components that are identified that relate to the earliest stage of literacy. But before we get started at kind of looking at those, we had a second poll question that we're interested in asking you just to kind of get a sense of where you are with things. And that is how familiar are you with using the lap time and lullabies kit at this point. It may be very familiar, somewhat, or not at all. We have quite a few not at alls. And we're at 70%, so I will end this poll. Okay. And share out what we have for results. Okay. Okay. 72% not at all. 24% somewhat. And 4% are very familiar with the lap time and lullabies kit. Okay. So the majority of our group is just kind of getting started with understanding it. Um, so thank you for responding. That will help us to know. And let's move on to the next slide, please. On this slide um, it are, are listed the 12 major components from the Lap Time and Lullabies Handbook, and they're color-coded to represent certain areas of literacy. For example, the first two are established relationships and share conversations that are found in booklets two and three, and these are in blue. The next three focus on vision, growing listening skills, and enhancing touch can be found in booklets four through six, and those are obviously the more sensory areas of literacy. The next two partner in play in booklet seven and explore the world in booklet eight are the ways that children learn about the world and understand the words they are being read to or are reading themselves. And then we nudge kids a little closer to actual reading through the next two, which are read together, booklet nine, and investigate books, booklet 10. Discover symbols is in booklet 11 and experiment with tools. Those bring our kids a little closer to actually writing. The symbols actually cross over, of course, between writing and reading. The final item on here is team up for literacy, which is found in booklet 13. And that gives some tips on how you might go about building a literacy team to cover all of the various things we're gonna talk about today. Jessica is going to get us started next with the social aspects. Jessica? Thanks so much, Kay. We're gonna talk about the social aspects next. We have um, on the screen a picture of the two parent handbooks, uh, booklet number two, Establish Relationships, and booklet number three, Share Conversations. Next slide, please. Establish Relationships. Children can learn to talk and eventually to read through a relationship with a beloved parent or grandparent, an admired older sibling or cousin, 
a respected caregiver or a teacher, or some other special person in their lives. Rosenketter and Wanless, 2006. Next slide, please. On the screen, we see a picture of a mom hugging her young child as he hugs her back. Booklet number two emphasizes the importance of establishing relationships early on. And as early support specialists, we acknowledge the best way that a child can learn and grow is through routines and rituals with their caregivers. So putting the parents in the driver's seat and acknowledging that their positive relationship with their baby is crucial and at the heart of this kit. Let's look at attachment. Eye contact, smiles, loving touches, hugging and vocalizing back and forth. These are all interactions a caregiver and child might share to build a healthy emotional bond. And thinking about responsive parenting. Typically, a young child will experience affection through eye contact, facial expressions, and smiling. Young children who are blind or have low vision rely on other senses to learn and interact with the world. By being physically nearby your, your young one, you can provide opportunities for hugs and touches, and your baby with vision can see your face. These opportunities might include massage, rocking, singing, using scented lotions or essential oils, or introducing textures. And finally, yes, sharing a literacy experience is also a great way to strengthen your relationship with your very young child. During these up-close interactions, you can begin to observe and learn the big or little ways that your little one might be reaching out to you. We urge you to consider partnering with your child to create respectful interactions. In other words, do with and not for. Partnering with your baby during routines and providing early confidence building opportunities will help to promote increased partic participation and in interactions with activities. These partnered interactions are respectful and inviting and reminding your baby that together the two of you can share the work and of course, also share the fun. Next slide. Share conversations. Children's belief in themselves as learners and their eagerness to learn new things is grounded in their early conversations with people who are important in their lives. Bartage and Siegel, 2005. We see a picture here of a baby looking content as they look towards their mom who is holding their hands and leaning over them. As we talk about share conversations or booklet number three, we get a glimpse at early conversations and conversation starters. Let's consider a greeting routine. Building routines for greeting your child will help signal the start of a conversation. Greeting your child by name will help him know that, yes, she's talking to me. And likewise, identifying yourself to your little one will help him to recognize you clearly. Soon, he will begin to recognize your voice, the bracelet that you show him or, and let him feel during that greeting or even the scent of your favorite soap. Some attempts might be subtle. First conversations can be short. You can observe your little one's expressions. This might be crying, smiling, making noises or facial expressions. Even more subtly, their breathing might change and become either faster or slower or deeper or quieter. When we consider turn-taking, we know that a true conversation involves this. Imitating the actions of a very young child and labeling those actions and waiting for them to repeat after you is a great early conversation starter. Eventually, my turn, your turn phrases can be incorporated into these interactions and noting that wait time or giving your little one about 10 seconds or so to respond might be needed. Singing and rhyming can be incorporated. This is a great early conversation starter. Reciting rhymes and finger plays can capture your baby's attention. By inserting rhyming phrases into routines like roll over, rover, during a diaper change, we begin to introduce letters and sounds. Making up songs during daily activities 
and to encourage or comment on your baby's actions can also spark conversation in a fun way. In the same spirit of our greeting routine, it's important to help your young child know that an activity is finished. By using words or gestures, we can signal all done. Within daily routines, when an activity ends, a child might have the opportunity to put an item back in its place, like a toy in its toy box. And some little ones benefit from a more concrete signal, like by putting an item from an activity that is just wrapped up into a special basket to signal all done. Signaling an end can also be used in conversations and interactions so that the adult doesn't just disappear. Finally, cues of all kinds can be used to help your child comprehend and anticipate events during daily routines. Sound cues, like Kay mentioned earlier about the keys jingling, or like a shaking, like shaking the bottle prior to feeding, can let her know that it's time to eat. Touch cues, like gently patting the nose before a nose wipe, can signal that the Kleenex is on its way. Giving your child a book prior to the start of a reading activity is a great example of an object cue. Words alone, like up, can signal to the baby that she is about to be picked up. And even pairing that touch, and even pairing touch with words, like giving a little tug under the arm and saying up, helps the baby to anticipate that action. Gestures and smells can be cues as well. Can you think of a way that a gesture might include it's time to leave the house or go, to the car, go in the car to an appointment or the store? I'm going to give you a few seconds to put some of your ideas in the chat. We can expand it to, to smell cues. How can a smell cue help to signal that it's bath time? Oh, I love that. Yeah. <laughs> Go ahead, Jake. Sorry. Get ready to leave. <laughs> Putting on shoes, jingling of the keys, uh, washcloth and soap container for bath time, ASL for shoes. So doing a fine, getting a towel, um, a smooth bangle bracelet for caregivers to um, identify themselves, a bib to eat, rocks for a rock for outside, turn hands like a tire for time to go. These are all great ideas. Awesome. Thank you. All right. Jenny will now cover sensory areas. Jenny? Thanks, Jess. Um, so in the picture, you will see the covers of booklet four, focus on vision, booklet five, growing listening skills, and booklet six, um, enhancing touch. And in these three booklets, focus on tuning families and providers into the learning that occurs through vision, hearing, and touch. So we're just covering these three senses right now. Uh, the quote says, the best time to help an infant learn to use vision is whenever a need naturally arises while doing interesting and enjoyable activities. Chen, 1999. Next slide, please. And in this image, you'll see a toddler who's sitting in a high chair. He has a bottle and a blue bowl on a tray. He's holding a spoon and is reaching into the bowl with his other hand and has a smile and a delightfully messy face. Um, most children uh, who are blind or visually impaired have some usable vision, as many of us have found, um, but the quality and quantity of what they see is reduced. And while we may not be able to determine exactly how much or how well that they can see, a functional vision assessment that is conducted by a teacher of children with visual impairments or a certified orientation and mobility specialist is a, a very important first step so that we can understand as much as possible. And once we know what a child is able to see and what their needs might be, it's a lot easier to set the stage for learning. And we start with that with looking at some um, potential for light. So providing optimal light is a must, especially if there's going to be books involved. But it's important to remember also that uh, children will have different light preferences based on their eye condition. And some types of light can be quite harsh. Um, this is something that we experience more in, I think, outdoor or in um, settings outside of the home, like schools and um, libraries, things like that, where they might have fluorescent light. So you always want to pay attention to that. 
um, natural light is a favorite. So whenever the opportunity arises, it's a great idea to take advantage of natural light. Um, and with this, positioning is one of the key elements so that light's used as an enhancement and not as a distractor. So by positioning a child with their back to the windows and other light sources, the light is able to come in from behind and highlight um, people, toys, and other visual materials in front of them. Um, we also want to pay attention to the position of high chairs. I can't tell you how many times I've gone into a home and seen one staring directly at like a bay window or something like that. And so it's hard to really identify what's in front of you when you're staring into the light. You can also try creative light um, such as using um, a reading light clipped to a board book uh, with sparkly pictures, or even putting that on a stander so that it is um, highlighting items that are sensory items that might be on the stander tray. So um, any anything like that, or light box is also a great way to highlight pictures and objects. We also want to consider magnification. Um, this might be necessary for many of our children who have low vision. Um, at young ages, supervised use of a large dome magnifier, which we love to call a magic window, can be fun to glide across a book, stop on an individual picture to enlarge them. With this, I do wanna stress that this is just a general introduction to using a device. Um, children who do have ongoing needs for low vision devices should undergo a low vision evaluation so that they're prescribed specific devices and um, the appropriate power of those. We also need to consider body position with vision. Um, it's critical to achieve the best um, or body position, I should say, is critical in achieving the best visual potential. Um, some children are going to require more support than others. So exploring a variety of different positions is also a good way to encourage looking behaviors in different visual fields. Um, and this could be sidelining while playing with hanging toys on a prop light box, or maybe by placing a child in a forward facing baby carrier while you're preparing a meal. And um, rolled towels and pool noodles have become my favorites for helping to position children in different, um, either you know, different seats or even on the floor with sideline to help provide some of that necessary support. Finding a comfortable position for children with physical limitations is often a real challenge. And this is a fantastic time to partner with a physical therapist so that you can um, they can help you to determine what types, types of strategies may be helpful. And, um, and then they in turn can um, benefit from you telling them exactly where that child needs to be positioned so they can see um, as, as well as they can. Okay, so let's talk about glasses. Um, glasses, patches, anything like that, keeping them on a toddler is a challenge for even the most diligent parent. And um, as many of you know, a persistent two-year-old is um, often gonna have the last word. So a daily glasses routine is a really great start. And um, you can start that by, you know, get ready face, get set ears, glasses on, Cheers and you know something very simple and then jump into an enjoyable hands-on activity. And this is a great way to redirect attention and um, to keep those glasses on for longer periods of time. And I tell families, um, you know, just little bits of time and um, and making that experience positive and then increasing as you go. So it's important to recognize the signs of visual fatigue, such as rubbing eyes, fussing, tearing. Um, and when you do notice these signs happening, then provide a visual break. And it's, it's best if you can take those glasses off the child before they rip them off, because then that whole entire experience is gonna be more positive. Um, so here's the time I'm going to ask you to put in the chat. Do any of you have helpful tips or um, things that you tell your families to help their children keep glasses on or even patches if, if that's something that's used? Um, I know this is one that pops up quite a bit in early intervention when we're looking. So <laughs> repeat the glasses rhyme. Yeah. Say get ready face, get set ears. Let's put glasses on. We did it. Cheers. And I repeat rhymes and sing songs all the time. Whole family wearing glasses at the same time. I love that one. That's a fun one. Using Mr. Potato Head. 
Um, it has a whole family who wears a patch. Great rhymes. Um, glasses on a favorite toy. These are all wonderful. Using a timer. That's a good one. Let them pick out of a patch. Okay, so hopefully we'll be collecting all of these. These are all wonderful ones. Older sibling modeling. I love that one too. Thank you. Finally, when um, we look at introducing books for children with low vision, you're going to want to try and find books that have visual interests, such as reflective pictures, um, photographs, lights, movable parts. Um, and then um, we're hoping that some of you will be able to join us for that second session that Jess and I are doing, um, because we'll be diving deeper into this. So this is great. Um, next slide, please. Okay, so this booklet is going to discuss um, growing listening skills. So the quote says, young children learn concretely by doing, feeling, touching, exploring. After they build this foundation, they can learn by listening, recalling, and processing those experiences mentally. Jolongo, 2008. Next slide, please. Okay. And in this image, um, there's a toddler with a striped shirt wearing a big smile as his caretaker whispers something into his ear. It's estimated that approximately 50 to 90% of young children's communication is um, that time is spent listening. Um, Jessica highlighted the development of language and its relationship to literacy through shared conversations. Um, as children tune into words, songs, stories um, that are shared with them through the context of daily routines, they're also learning how to understand and use language in context. Tuning into environmental sounds and cueing your child to listen as you provide descriptions, this can provide context and meaning. Um, this is something that takes place and you can take advantage of during everyday routines like, ooh, oh, I hear water. Let's follow that sound. It's coming from the bathroom. Oh, it's bath time. So, you know, that's something that might happen every day, but you can also highlight sounds at other times. For instance, what's that sound? Can you hear it? Wee -oo, wee -oo. Oh, it's a fire truck. And then provide additional context, maybe by looking out the window with your child, walking outside, um, even taking a trip um, to the community to get an up close look at a real fire truck. And this gives greater meaning to the sound and also to the label that we're using for that item so that they really understand the next time they hear that what exactly that is. Incorporating wordplay into various routines is a fun way to help your toddler begin to understand words, syllables, and letter sounds. Um, clapping out syllables while singing some of the common finger plays that we do, so like pat a cake, pat a cake, baker's man, um, or if they're wanting their bottle, saying, oh, you want your book, book bottle. So just really highlighting those whenever you have those opportunities. Um, I loved when I taught preschool doing this with rhythm sticks, and I was just observing recently our preschool teacher here, and she was using pool noodles with her um, her students to help them tap along to the beat of um, songs and some different syllables. So that was that was great too. Uh, before the age of three, an estimated three quarters of children experience at least one ear infection that will temporarily affect their ability to hear. Um, and because children with visual impairments rely greatly on sound to teach them about the environment around them, it's especially important to schedule periodic hearing tests, um, identify signs of ear infections early, and protect against harmful environmental noises. And this has really become like a common question when I know when I go out on visits is, you know, has your child, did they pass their newborn infant hearing screening? And if not, have you had follow-ups or do they have um, a, an infection. Um, it's also important to middle, excuse me, to minimize sound clutter, such as television or excessive chatter that can make it difficult to tune in. And this is really something that we do naturally as learners. Um, I know when I'm driving to a new place, I'll turn off the radio and kind of stop talking so that I can focus on the route that I'm taking. Um, so we're used to just doing that, but in our homes, we get so used to background noise that sometimes we don't recognize their potential to disrupt the learning of our young children. Um, if I was to belt out a 
toddler tune right now, uh, chances are that you would all be singing it for the rest of the evening. So I will spare you. But I want to um, just highlight how important um, songs and rhymes are and how they really have a way with sticking with us. Um, the rhythms, beats, the repetitive words encourage memory, movement, and reciprocal interaction. Um, An experience with rhymes in the first three years of life has been linked to early awareness of word and syllable sounds. And with little learners, the sillier we make them, the better we know that. And finally, if we want if we want to build good listeners, then it's critical that we model good listening habits ourselves. Children, they can sense when we are listening to them and when we're distracted. And um, in a time of devices, this is really more evident now than ever before. So it's very important to make sure that we're making physical contact and eye contact um, and acknowledging communication attempts. You know, I hear you or I see you pointing. What is it that you're trying to tell me? And walking through that so that they really you're, you're affirming that you recognize they're communicating with you. Next slide, please. Okay, and uh, finally, we're going to talk about touch. And so this booklet um, digs into that. Um, and the quote says, touch is about physical contact between children and their caregivers and peers, and about providing young children with tactile experiences of the world around them. Both kinds of touch are absolutely essential. Carlson, 2006. Next slide. And in this image, there's a chubby little child's hand seen against um, the background of their blue checkered shirt and green pants. Um, touch contributes to children's emergent literacy in many ways. And for children with vision loss, um, tactile exploration plays a key role in providing contextual information. And this is especially important for children who may become braille readers and writers. Um, but I do wanna mention, you know, not, not just those reading braille. I mean, the children who have low vision are gonna need to use their sense of touch to fill in um, the holes of, of what they're not seeing. It is a tremendous responsibility for or as an adult in your child's life to develop a trusting relationship through respectful touch. Um, a child who has positive experiences with touch is more likely to take risks and to explore without fear. So for instance, if by using hand under hand guidance and leading your child's hand to a new texture, um, you're letting them know that they can ride along with you, um, and but they still maintain that control to take their hand away if they want to jump off that ride or if they're uncomfortable with it. And that's really, that's that's more important some, um, in the beginning than the touch itself sometimes is just establishing that trusting relationship so that they're willing to dig deeper into it. Um, incorporating touch cues is a great way to aid in communication and language development. For instance, a gentle tap on the side of your child's temple, um, as you say, glasses on, can help them anticipate their glasses being placed on their face. Young children explore their uh, sense of touch in a variety of ways. Um, and as we know, baby's toy hasn't been truly loved until it's covered in slobber. Um, Infants and toddlers use their mouths to compare textures. And for children with vision loss, it's very typical for this stage of um, exploration to hang around a bit longer. Um, and it's also very common for toddlers with low vision to preview textures first with their feet or maybe an elbow before they're ready to use their hands. One of the best ways to encourage um, touching with the hands is tummy time and floor play. And this is difficult for so many uh, families with young children with visual impairments because just there's, you know, in the beginning, sometimes nothing that is motivating us to look up and it's it can be uncomfortable. So um, a lot of times that can be avoided, but it's crucial to make sure that tummy time is being, um, is happening each day. Um, you know, as a child presses their hands into the floor to support her upper body, she's also increasing the strength of her hands and arms and shoulders. Um, and so this is really important for that tactile exploration. Also, as you help your child sweep their hands from left to right across their high chair um, to try to locate a small piece of food, you're modeling the same movements that they'll use to locate tactile pictures or braille on a page. 
um, with tactile expiration, it's important to pay attention to nonverbal cues also, such as crying or gagging. And this might indicate that there is um, a certain type of touch that is uncomfortable for a child. So we really need to honor that, again, with that trust and, and, um, and honor that communication that they're telling us. So really pay attention as you're introducing new textures, especially. So now that we've discussed how to learn through the senses, Kay is going to elaborate more on um, understanding the world. Thank you, Jenny. Um, pictured here under understanding the world are uh, booklets number seven, partner in play, and booklet number eight, exploring the world. And these are both certainly ways that our young children learn about the world so that they can understand what's being spoken and what they later will read. So let's start with partner in play. Through play, children learn vocabulary, concepts, a variety of abilities, self-confidence, motivation, and an awareness of the needs of others. These factors are just as important in learning to read as the ability to recognize letters and sounds. Ziegler, Singer, and Bishop Joseph, 2004. So those of us who hang around with young children a lot realize that play is extremely important and a, the major way for young children to learn, largely because play is fun. It's very engaging and there is no right or wrong way to play. And that's important to keep in mind. Vision loss can impact a child's quality and quantity of play mostly because they are unable to kind of look around and sort of see what the other kids are doing, what other what parents are doing, and then imitate it. So um, in order to kind of help our kids along with this, it is important to engage with children in their play as the adult. And actually research has shown that for all young children, an, an adult participating creates a lot richer play experience. So if we start, take your child's lead. In other words, figure out what really pushes your child's button, what things they enjoy doing, what things they enjoy playing with. And then your role as the adult is to model and expand additional things. An example is if you maybe have a child who really likes to a little toy car, but their experience so far is to twirl the, the wheel and listen to the sound that it creates. You can model then that you can bring that car down on the floor and run it across the floor. It can go down a little chute or an incline, a lot of different kinds of things so that the child starts to understand that there are different kinds of things that you can do with that car. There are tons of kinds of play out there. And what I'd like you to do is just think of one or two play activities or categories of play that come to your mind and if you'd throw those in the chat box, please. And those are, we'll kind of look at what kinds of play activities would be important to welcome our children into. Have imaginary. Yeah. Imaginary play. Yeah. <laughs> imaginary play yep, we've got imaginary play. Messy play, making music, water play, kitchen fun. Sensory bin play, mm -hmm. great ideas, outdoor, reachable objects and lights, wonderful. Okay, great. Well, you've come up with a lot of very important ideas. And again, just looking at what kinds of activities, play activities we can welcome our children to are critical. Another focus would be looking at your children's play environments. And that means the surroundings in which your child is playing. Just an example of one example is a characteristic of size. With a real young baby, of course, the size should be small, comfortable, so that the baby doesn't feel lost in space, and it's so the baby can interact with things that are close by. So a crib kind of environment would be a real good one. But as your child gets older and becomes a toddler, it is important that that child's space grow with the growing ability of a child to move around in space. Another example might be the placement of that play environment. For example, maybe in the center of family activity rather than back in a bedroom somewhere. 
This enables the child to kind of keep track of all the things that are going on, maybe some cooking in the kitchen and all the other activities, or as a family member walks through the center of the house, uh, there can be some social interactions going on. Even a pet can come by and give your baby a good sniff. Um, also, there is a term here, stay put play spaces. And that really refers to the picture here is of a young infant. Um, I'm saying young because she looks like her hands are still fisted. And she, I'm saying, I'm guessing, but she is laying on her back. And there are two very colorful beaded toys that are suspended from above that are about where her hands, if she's batting, which I assume that's what she's doing, where her hands might bat and contact these objects. She is looking at the one toy, so I assume she has some usable vision and could watch as that toy moves after she bats it. Or if nothing else, she could hear the sound that she's creating so basically setting up an environment like this causes a child to be able to act on the environment by him or herself. This whole concept is really based on Lily Nielsen's active learning approach. Many of you may be familiar with Lily Nielsen and the types of things that she purported, but if you're not, there is a website here, activelearningspace.org, which we'll put in the chat box. And basically she looked at the same thing as what is going on with this little girl is if you structure a play environment, particularly for children who are limited in their motor abilities and also are visually impaired, that you can help kids to reach out to interact with the environment in whatever way possible, rather than having adults manipulating their bodies and having to run around and gather things that have rolled out of sight or out of hand. And so it stays right there. So a child then can come back and find it the same place they found it before. This is a really important concept for many of our young children. And then we can shift our focus to play things. What kinds of things in that play environment are interesting to your child? And that can be just because that's something they're familiar with, or you can look at the sensory qualities that your child seems to be really most interested in. Visual qualities, perhaps, like these beads that are hanging, bright colors, um, shiny things, lighted things. Maybe that's what your child really is interested in. Perhaps it is tactile things and kind of assessing what kind of textures are really pleasant to your child or really they like to taste with their mouth or touch with their hands or their feet. Or perhaps sounds. Maybe it is sounds that are at a certain um volume level, not too loud, but not too soft, or perhaps musical sounds that really attract your child. And also real objects. Real objects are wonderful. They're things you find right in your home environment. They're very available. Uh, things like if you go out to your kitchen, the pots and pans and wooden spoons and metal measuring spoons, and not only are they different than the qualities of most store-bought toys, which are mostly molded plastic to keep them clean, but they, so you can introduce your child to metal and wood and all kinds of different types of materials, as well as real objects that are used in daily life. So, so your child can figure out the function of what is going on as well. As long as the objects are safe for your child, not toxic, don't have sharp edges and pieces to chew off, things like that, pretty much anything goes that you could gather in your home environment. The final item here is books about play. We can bring in literacy into the play environment by finding books that are about play scenarios that your child knows about. One of my personal favorites is Pots and Pans by Patricia Hubble which is a little, it depicts a little toddler sitting in the middle of the kitchen, surrounded by pots and pans and just banging away. The text of this book is very sound oriented. So it is also very attractive. Next slide, please. And then we move on to exploring the world. As a child explores, she adds to her experiences, increasing the range and completeness of her concepts. These will be the foundation for the meaning she brings to stories she hears and to all reading and writing. Wright and Stratton, 2007.
Next. So exploring the world pictured here is a little person. I'm guessing maybe a little boy, but it could be either because he has his back to us wearing a pair of little jeans and has bare feet. And he is attempting to crawl up several uh, cement steps, probably up to the front porch of his home. And sitting on the bottom step is his teddy bear. Many of these kinds of exploratory act activities are the basis for kids then later on becoming good travelers. There are a couple of people that you might wanna consider putting on your team. And some of you may be very familiar with these folks, or you may be one. One is a certified orientation and mobility specialist, which in a traditional sense would help older children and adults to begin to uh, learn skills such as using a long cane, uh, determining when to safely cross an intersection, riding on buses, traveling routes at school or to a job. But it all begins now. So a mobility specialist can be an important person on your team to look at what's going on right now and make some suggestions about things that could be added to that. And then also look into the future about what kinds of uh, expectations a parent might have for their child. A PT or physical therapist is another important team member, particularly for our kids who have limited motor abilities, but also for our children who are blind, who uh, may need a little help with things like balance, gait, and posture so that their movements are more fluid. But all of this starts really with a child's own body. If you look at your child at first as an infant, they just kind of flail around. They really have no purposeful movement of their limbs or hands. But eventually with all that flailing around, they, the hands come together and they begin to explore and understand that those hands belong to me. And then they start to grab their clothes and chew on it. They bring their feet up to their head. They may even kind of turn slightly from side to side to explore the planes of their body. All of this exploration of your own body then sets the stage for doing outside exploration in the world. And that usually starts with some indoor exploration. For example, we talked about a crib space as being a nice, comfortable space. And that can be a starting point so that things can be easily reached and found and an infant feels safe. Then you can go from that to being room explorers, whether a child is able to actually walk from room to room and explore, or you simply put them on a little pack in the front and then you bring them around and kind of show what different things. For example, you could explore a bathroom and find the water sound and where that's coming from, the smells of soap, the towels that are hanging, the floor surface that is typical in a bathroom, and don't forget the ceiling. We often forget, and kids often don't know for a long time, that there actually is a ceiling to the room. Simple experiments. For example, if you live in a cold climate, you could go get a snow snowball and bring it in, or you can grab an ice cube from your freezer and check out the difference between that hard, very cold thing that you are touching, and then as it melts down, it becomes a much more lukewarm liquid. Simple cooking activities are great too, because kids get the idea that if we are going to eat, there is some process involved in making that happen. And a simple cooking activity like shaker pudding or something like that also shows kids that um, foods transition from maybe a liquid substance to something much more solid or sticky. Sidestep trailing. Trailing actually refers to the um, this, uh, technique of using your hand in some way often to follow along a surface to find things like light switches or things, or to keep track of where you are in space. When young children, your child starts to get up and start cruising, your child may be using kind of a, a modified version of sidestep trailing. For example, children who are cruising usually hold on maybe to a coffee table or follow along a wall, mostly for balance, but then it can really do a dual purpose of keeping track of where you are in space. Moving from indoor to outdoor exploration is kind of the next step. And it may be your child is a little bit anxious about doing that, and many children are, because when you go outside, it is wide open space. There are a lot of loud sounds that were very muted when you were indoors and maybe different sounds. 
that lawnmower sounds like it's right on you when you go outside, as well as that motorcycle that is passing by. One transition possibility is to take a favorite activity of your indoor activity of your child and take it outdoors. If your child's a big snack aficionado, you can take a blanket, throw it outside the back of your door, and you can have a picnic snack. Same thing with rolling a ball back and forth on the patio or out in the grass. And that, if your child will tolerate the grass texture or taking that indoor swing and bringing it outside. A bigger space is the community and exploring the community can be really a lot of fun and open a lot of doors for your child as well. For example, starting by maybe just going down a couple doors down to your favorite neighbor to deliver something or go have a little talk together. Or you can look at going around your block. Also, you can um, look at uh, finding the local park or playground. Then you can go further and, and visit the grocery store, the library, the post office, and it goes on and on as little mini field trips. So your child, before he or she is able to actually traverse those things or use those, has an idea about what's going on out in the world. Safety considerations, of course, where all children of this age are primary. And um, so really watching out for the safety. Little kids don't think about safety and they rely on us as adults to help them with those things. For our kids with limited vision, a couple of additional techniques are often helpful. One of them would be something like protective hands, helping your child to put their hands out front as they maybe are going about ready to encounter a table with their head is a very interesting and very important type of technique to develop um, so that you can kind of learn to protect yourself. Human guide, which is basically walking with another person. And in this case, instead of grabbing your child's hand and pulling them along, offering a couple of fingers for your child to hold or a wrist can be very helpful in letting your child still remain some control, but have some guidance and a little bit of security if they're going into unfamiliar environments. You'll find probably the human guide technique used a little bit more with very young children than as children get older because every environment is new and you may need to monitor safety a little bit, particularly in areas like parking lots and other things outside that could be unsafe. Childproofing the environment, Typical things like gating stairs that your child may not see coming up and also putting um, plugs into outlets. Um, many times people think, well, he won't really find that, will he? Well, about the time you think he won't, he will. So, okay. So now Jessica is going to move us on to reading. Jessica? Thank you, Kay. Let's get moving toward reading. We have the two um, parent handbooks on here. We've got... Um, We've got booklet number nine and booklet number 10. Uh, booklet number nine is reading together. Next slide. Uh, picture books require interaction between an adult and a child. Surrounding children with books is not enough. They need caring adults to invite them into the world of literature. Jalongo, 1988. Let's move on to reading together. The image description is of a father who looks down at his baby in his lap and he is holding a book, showing it to the baby. The Read Together booklet explores the many ways you can begin to invest in your child's future, reading and writing skills. Let's explore attention span first. Asking yourself, is my little one tired of listening? Should I try a different book? Does he need a break? to get up and move around are all part of the guesswork during reading activities. You should follow your child's cues and don't be afraid to make adjustments to what you read, how you read it, and how long you read it. Did you know that according to IRA and NAEYC in 1998, sharing books with your infant and toddler is one of the greatest contributions you can make toward his emerging literacy. Reading can never be done too early and is a major investment in your child's future ability to read and write. Read together experiences are powerful. And let's look at some considerations. Your reading experiences early on with your baby may rely heavily on your presentation skills. 
Books with bright, colorful pictures also capture the attention of a baby with vision. Grasping a book, shaking it, and even chewing on it are all part of the literacy experience as well. Breaking up reading routines with opportunities to move around or simple action rhymes can also help to sustain attention. Depending on the unique needs of a child, there are many alternative ways to have meaningful literacy experiences. Books can be experienced without pages. You can create a story box or a story bag with items to go along with the picture book or without the actual book. Another fun idea is a story pillow, adding Velcro to a lap size pillow and attaching child friendly sized, child friendly textured materials to go along with a storybook or make up your own tale. The Reading Together Parent Handbook has a number of out of the book, out of the book reading ideas. In addition, consider creating a literacy-rich environment in your home or supporting families with ideas on how to create a literacy-rich environment at home. You can get real cozy and create a book nook, complete with a soft rug and comfy pillows and upright books that are switched out for novelty. You can visit the public library or even take a little walk to your neighborhood little free library. You can visit garage sales in your neighborhood or thrift stores and start curating a home library. Some other ideas for creating a literacy-rich home environment can include modeling literacy activities, and this could be as simple as asking for a Braille menu when you're out for dinner. It could involve some sort of everyday literacy activity too, like making a list or reading the newspaper. Next slide. Investigating books is our next parent booklet. For infants, books, like other toys, are things to touch, turn, shake, and put in your mouth. Well-chosen books can also provide valuable experiences with pictures, textures, sounds, and words. Bartage and Siegel, 2005. When we look at investigating books, uh, we have two adorable pictures on the screen here. One is of a toddler turning a page of uh, this Kit's book titled, Where's Little Fuzzy? And the second picture is a slightly younger toddler chewing on the cover of the Where's, the Little, Where's Little Fuzzy um, book. Learning about books and what they are are important prerequisites for reading and writing. Encouraging active participation during literacy activities is key, especially for a baby without vision. Books and book experiences will vary with the age or developmental level of the child. Books for babies might um, be one that a baby can look at or feel and taste, and most it'd be most appealing for young infants, uh, like plastic bath books or board books or fold-out books, and even clock books are examples of fun, interactive, multi-sensory books for the youngest reader. Then, as your baby grows, new book experiences should follow. A toddler might like a board picture book, a pop-em book, a book with movable pictures and tabs that lift or slide. And these are just a short list of great examples of books to read together with your toddler. You should take into consideration sensory. Sensory should be part of the selection of materials uh, for the reading experiences and what those sensory preferences are. Babies with vision are able to, to get a good look at pictures as you read the words. So how do we give babies who are blind or low vision a good touch, a good smell, a good listen, or a good move? Stores carry books that might incorporate smell or tactile books with interesting textures. Board books with sound are also popular and can be found almost anywhere where books are sold. APH offers braille books with interesting components for exploration. And there might even come a time when you want to add or make um, one of your child's favorite title that's not already um, accessible. You can make that accessible for your child. When considering adapting a store-bought book, APH has a product that can add sound to a page of any book to meet the child's unique interest. And they also offer clear sticky pages for braille that you can type um, the words that are on the page and then add the braille to the book. Items that connect to the story can accompany it in a bag or a box for a child to hold and manipulate. Adaptations can even be made so that book handling is addressed for your young child. 
you can just add a little soft Velcro to the bottom outside corner of the page, and that'll make it easier for grasping and manipulating. Speaking of customizing books, while there are many ways to put a spin on store-bought books, you can also try your hand at a homemade book. You can use your sewing skills, or if you're like me, you'd have to tap into somebody else's sewing skills. And you can make a cloth book. Um, it can be sewn and you can have child safe items added. Talking books um, or talking photo albums are a fun way to personalize and connect with photographs. Wouldn't it be cool to record grandma and grandpa's voice on a page with their photo? Personal experience books are another homemade book idea. A homemade title, A Day at the Park, um, experience book following a trip to the park with items from that trip can be placed into a bag or a box. And that's a great way to document a fun event. The event can be re revisited and you can imagine what kinds of things might be collected for that box. Sticks, grass, maybe a leaf. And all of those things can be saved for later exploration and, of course, a later conversation. Book concepts and skills will evolve. And we really look forward to um, supporting that. And, and as uh, the baby changes the way that they interact with the book and the understanding of the book, um, it will really continue to um, evolve. So when we think about book handling or book skills, we might think about how the book is grasped, um, opening and closing books, orient orienting them um, upright, pointing to pictures in the books, exploring all parts of the books, noticing symbols, the list goes on and on. The Investigate Books Parent Booklet can really get families thinking outside the book and initiate fun, meaningful literacy experiences tailored to the needs of their baby. And of course, with the theme of this whole kit, it puts parents in the driver's seat for careful selection of books with their unique components. Kay, can you get us moving towards writing? Okay, thank you. Moving toward writing includes booklets 11, Discover Symbols, and 12, Experiment with Tools. We're gonna to start out with Discover Symbols, which crosses over between the reading and moving on to writing. Next slide, please. Discover symbols. Babies learn to recognize and use simple symbols during daily routines. The adult's job is not to teach, but to facilitate discoveries. Gonzales Mania, 2006. Obviously, young children do not come into the world as abstract thinkers. Symbolic thinking develops over time. There are many symbolic experiences that are early but none of them involve letters or numbers. A couple of examples of those might be playing with a mirror. At first, a child looks into the mirror, sees a reflection and has no idea that's, that's really them in the mirror. And gradually they start to understand that it is. Action symbols, when you open your arms to a child who's able to see that, that um, gesture or the squeaking of a door, that's an action symbol that indicates that somebody realizes that somebody has just come home. So there are number, a number of these early symbolic experiences, but letters or numbers, particularly drill and practice, really have no part in what we're doing here with symbols in early years. Toddlerhood, usually about developmentally starting in the age of 18 months, start to exhibit pretend activities. And that's kind of like what we talked about, the, the block up to the ear, which is kind of pretending that that is a cell phone. There is a progression of symbol uh, learning with the first of all familiar 3D objects, like we've been talking about object cues. You hand a child a spoon at, at, uh, at uh, meal time, and they realize that that 3D object, the spoon represents it's time to eat. Moving from that to three-dimensional shapes, the ball that a child is rolling back and forth with you, or that um, orange that they found um, the, at the grocery store, which is just a, a round 3D shape. And then two-dimensional shapes, flat shapes. For example, puzzles that have puzzle pieces that are shaped, or even that square cracker that your child is eating at snack time. Then moving on to pictures for children who are able to access pictures, starting with very simple ones and moving to more complex ones, starting with very familiar objects and moving to ones that are less familiar. 
Textures also um, are another way, and we've talked about how textures can be used to cue children. If a child really relates heavily to the car seat texture in their car seat, you can hand your child a piece of that texture indicating it's time to go get in the car. Spoken words, and that can be signed as well, or gestures come next. They're a little more abstract. And certainly we already talked about the fact that kids learn to listen first, receptively, and then speak languages. Letters uh, are come next, usually the most familiar letters that children have in their names, followed by numbers. And kids start out by rotely saying one, two, three, four, without really any realization of the quantity that's involved. Gradually, they figure out that one is different than two and then can add the symbol to those numbers as well. Environmental symbols are huge. They're everywhere. And an example is pictured here. There's a bright red stop sign on a blue sky background. And those are the types of things that you can find on just a walk through your neighborhood. And it's really not enough to just sort of talk about the fact it's there, but help your child shinny up that pole and bang on that metal and check the shape of that sign. And for those who can access the letters, looking at those bright white letters. Braille symbols can be found in elevators and menus out in the community. And you can read mail that the postman carries to you, like a letter from grandma that just arrived in the mail. The questions here at the bottom are print or braille, listening and or speaking. For many, many of our children, we really do not know clearly enough to kind of narrow it down to just one of those. So giving all the options to our kids is a good bet. Next slide, please. So let's look at experimenting with tools. Writing materials fascinate young children. The child's discovery that writing and drawing tools leave tracks and that the form of these is under the child's control sparks curiosity. Chicken Dance and Casper, 2004. So pictured here is a little girl who obviously is in her playroom, judging from all the toys and things around her. She has a metal pan that's been flipped over like a drum and she is happily tapping on it with a wooden spoon. Before we can start introducing these kinds of activities though, as has already been talked about by Jenny, preparing hands is very important. Hand strength, dexterity, being able to hold and release objects that are small and handheld are important precursors for the ability to then handle a tool. Research has shown us that early tool use starts with short, light tools, for example, a little rattle that a baby brings up to his or her mouth, or a little spoon, as we've talked about, for eating, and then gradually moves to longer and heavier tools, such as if your child enjoys pushing a, a toy mop around on the floor. There are tons of everyday tools in, that you can look at in everyday life, from a hairbrush to brush your hair, to a step stool that can be pushed up the counter to reach the sink, to um, musical types of tools and what this little girl is playing with, simply taking a spoon and banging on a pan. So those are really important things that are available at home and in daycare settings and other places that are great to introduce. Two additional categories that are important for our children who have limited vision. One is mobility tools, and that usually refers to some type of a mobility device, whether that's some type of a long cane or some other thing that would help a child to travel more safely and figure out where they are. Vision tools, such as Jenny was talking about glasses, are also really important ones to make sure that we're looking at those types of tools as well. The last two categories here are tactile literacy tools and print literacy tools. One is, for example, tactile literacy tools first would be ways to sort of adapt regular activities that kids like to participate in, such as coloring with crayons, perhaps slipping a window screen under. Quick story, I have a little girl who was four before she even started receiving any type of vision services. And so we laid out the crayons and she helped me put the window screen under the paper and she grabbed that crayon and I'm just watching as a little whippersnapper is just going like crazy and listening to that zip, zip, zip sound that she created as she was coloring. And pretty soon I watched as she took her hand and she placed her hand on top of the paper and started feeling what was going on there, what she had created. She stopped, she put her hands on her hips, 
She turned and looked at me and went, Miss Kay, I'm making my own braille. And that to me was just an absolutely aha moment, as I'm sure many of you have had similar aha moments, which really tell us that it is worth the effort and worth the creativity to try to come up with ways that really pique our kids' interest in literacy. Certainly Braille Writer and other tools, scented markers, things like that can fall in there as well. Print literacy tools, dome magnifier that Jenny talked about, which can be a missile, so you have to be a little careful and supervise that carefully. But a pillow stand, for example, taking a bed pillow instead of a reading stand to get the book up nice and close and snuggy can be kind of nestled in your child's lap with the book and then kind of bring it up close so your child can get close enough to look at the book or touch the book or taste the book. And then a child safe lamp. Lighting is critical for most children and making sure that it, the light is cool, not hot, and that the electrical cord is not an issue. So next, Jenny is going to move us into looking at how to build a literacy team that can help with all of these various things. Jenny? Great. Thanks, Kay. And um, so on here, you'll see booklet number 13, Building a Literacy Team, It Takes a Village. Next slide. And the quote, alone we can do so little, together we can do so much, by Helen Keller. And really together is the operative word in this quote. Um, next slide, please. We've talked a lot about information, of a lot of information here, um, and it can be overwhelming to think that one person would be having to do all of this, and we don't have to, which is the beauty of it. We have a team. Um, and in reviewing all of these 12 different components, certainly you have seen yourself as part of that team and where you might fit in. Um, at this table, you see three women sitting together in a coffee shop, and um, two of them smile as they give each other a high five. So what we need to really remember is that parents and primary caregivers drive that literacy bus. They know their child the best. They hold the key to what motivates them. And along with other family and friends, their input is going to be most valuable. So we really need to honor that and, and really take that lead. Um, and then although early intervention programs throughout um, various states are different, um, one thing that we all have in common is that there's a core team of providers, um, both in early intervention and in early childhood education. And so um, we need to tap into that. You know, we have occupational therapists and physical therapists who are those key members to um, help provide input on engaging sensory um, systems, put positioning, um, when and where they the child uh, can explore their environment and how to access, and then also, you know, speech therapists and building um, and strengthening early communication skills, which are going to be critical foundations for listening and speaking and reading and writing. And then your vision um, professionals, of course, uh, teacher for children with visual impairments, um, orientation and mobility specialists, they're really critical members of those teams that are going to help provide access. Um, and this can be from daily living skills to play skills, um, providing exposure to enhanced picture books, pre-braille, um, anything along those lines to help fill those gaps. Um, next slide, please. In addition to those 12 booklets that highlight the components of early literacy, there's some additional pieces in this kit that you're going to want to know about. So the first one is the Developmental Milestones and Ranges booklet, and it provides just that, developmental milestones from ages 0 to 36 for each of those 12 highlighted areas. Um, and these are a great um, way to help families identify uh, things that they can put on the IFSP, some different outcomes. And then the Sensory Strength Snapshot booklet and this is a great tool. It's um, really baby's first learning media profile. It goes into all the different senses. There's a checklist um, in all of the sensory areas and um, you know, being able to recognize how these um, work together. There's a routines booklet, bath time and bedtime, and it includes a variety of activities. And um, last but not least, a collection of rhymes and songs that are for um, bath time and bedtime. And I like to hang them in both of those settings. And all of these we will be really diving into during the next webinar in June. So I'm going to go ahead and pass it on to Kay to share about the stereo books real quick. Okay, the final two pieces are two storybooks. 
There are interactive books. They can, uh, can contain braille and print, and they have rhyming text and a lot of manipulative pieces. They're designed for children, one to three years of age. And there are three pictures here, and I'm just gonna kind of quickly go through these to kind of talk in context about information about the books. The first book is called Where's Little Fuzzy? And you had a chance to see that earlier when Jessica was talking about books and she showed a couple of pictures. And the first picture of this little guy on the left, he is exploring that book as well. He is reaching out to grab a plastic gate that can be opened or closed. And behind that gate, Little Fuzzy, the main character of this book is hiding. So this is a hide and find book, but not only can kids find Little Fuzzy, but Little Fuzzy's buddies, Little Squeaker and Little Scratchy and different things. So kids have to look at each page and try to figure out if they can find someone, and if so, who that character is. The middle picture here is of a slightly younger little boy or girl, and this, uh, this little one is exploring the Butterflies book. The butterflies has butterfly shaped pieces in a bright blue color that goes against nice contrast against the white pages and they're laminated and they have Velcro tabs on them so that they can be taken on and off the pages. This little person is actually exploring the pieces prior to using it functionally as a book. And so on his one hand, he is holding the butter, one of butterfly pieces against his cheek. And the other hand, he is holding a, um, a butterfly finger puppet that can be used to actually act out the motions and the concepts that are introduced in this book, which are things like on, off, in, out, bumpy, smooth, that type of thing. So it is a simple concept book. The third one here is another um, depiction of a a child reading the Where's the Little Fuzzy book, but this time on her grandma's lap. So it is a read together activity. And she's broken out in a big smile as her hand reaches into the pocket and she finds Little Fuzzy. Both of these books come with make it fun tip sheets that give you some initial ideas of how you might be able to use the books. And then you can go from there to your own ideas. The handbook and the booklets, um, and the storybooks are really kind of a package deal and they complement each other well. We're very hopeful that you will find this as a, as a great tool for your toolbox of um, things to use with your young children. And now Jessica is going to move on and wrap us up for today and whet your appetite for number two webinar. Awesome. Hey, thank you. Um, we have a picture of both the lap time, both lap time and lullaby storybooks here. We've got butterflies on the left and where's fuzzy on the right. Um, both the lap time and lullabies parent handbook and the storybook companions are available uh, through American Printing House for the Blind, and they are available through Quota Funds. All right, is your brain spinning? Are you thinking of an outside of the book activity that we that would be just perfect for a little one? Or are you thinking of a little one and how you might try to adapt or make a homemade book for them? Or maybe a family is on your mind and you can't wait to share these ideas with them, but need a little bit more support. Go ahead. Yeah, so um, on the sleeve, we have a picture of three girls in bathing suits holding books and they're jumping into a pool. Um, Jenny and I invite you to part two of Lap Time and Lullabies on June 6th as we take a deeper dive and explore more possibilities for fun and meaningful literacy experiences. Um, the registration link is in the chat, and we do encourage you to take some of the concepts and ideas that you heard about today. And if you have a child or family you are thinking of, you can come prepared to participate on June 6 with that child in mind. And it would be even better if you um, would email Jenny and I ahead of time. Um, you can email descriptions, you can email photos uh, for your early literacy projects, and we can help incorporate those into our planning. We're so excited to celebrate Kay's work in this area and to share it with each and every one of you. Thank you so much for coming today and we can take your questions now. Wow, <laughs> thank you so much. That was a ton of information. Um, we, we can stay on and take some questions now. Uh, but I will give the closing code for those of you who want it for ACVREP credits. It is.